evening, two major belief systems, if you like, lay claim to the truth of going head to head. No matter which side of the fence that you tend to reside on, okay, um, by the end of the night, that you will be better informed about atheism and about Islam. Respected Professor Krauss, guests, brothers and sisters, friends, relatives, I greet you with the warmest Islamic greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. But the question is, can we have an infinite past? Does the infinite make sense in the real world? Now, clearly, theists and atheists can agree on one thing. If anything exists at all, there must be something preceding it that always existed. How did this eternally existing reality come to be? The answer is that it never came to be. It always existed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Peace be with you. Welcome again to another episode of our program Path to Guidance. With me today, a special brother who is visiting the United States from England, and I'm meeting with him in Irving, Texas. Brother Hamza Zursus. He's a da'ya, meaning a man who calls people to Islam. He is specializing in debating and defending Islam, an apologist also for Islam. His mission is to invite people to see the beauty of Islam. And today we're going to share his story, how he saw this beauty, and see the steps he took on the path of guidance. I hope you enjoy this program with us, and let me on your behalf, welcome our brother Hamza today. Welcome brother and thank you for being with us. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. What I would like to start with you is to give us and give our viewers a little background about yourself, how you grew up, the environment you grew up with, your education, and geographically, where did you live in Europe before you settled? if you were not born in the United Kingdom. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. My name is Hamza Andreas Dordis, and I come from a Greek background. Both of my parents are Greek. My dad is from the mainland Greece, born in Athens, but originally from Northwest Greece. My mother is ethnically Greek, but born in Cyprus. And they both came to England in the 1970s and I was born in England, 1980. So that makes Masha me Allah. 33 years old. MashaAllah. And I have a brother and a sister. And we're very close, as Greek families are typically quite close. And the kind of environment I was brought up in was essentially, from a socioeconomic perspective, a working class environment especially for the first 14 years of my life, we lived in very tall apartment blocks. Typically, it would be called a ghetto, like the Bronx, I guess. But then we moved out when I was 14. But during those years, those formative years, my father, he basically didn't like organized religion, but he loved Jesus and some of his sayings and you could probably best describe my father as a new age humanist, stroke, spiritualist, very loving guy. Interesting. Very self-empowered kind of individual and deep in some ways. And that reflected on us and we were inspired to investigate about the truth of life. So in the place where I was being brought up in, in London, we were very engaging with other cultures and religions. So my first kind of interaction with Islam was at a very young age. It wasn't a direct interaction, but it was more of a cultural interaction. So at school, I would have friends who are Muslim, and I would see some of the cultural practices or the beliefs that they were having. So I was engaged with Islam at a very young age. But the direct engagement came a little bit after. 
So this engagement was mainly observation, really, just... It was mainly observation, but the direct engagement came when I was in high school. Tell us a little bit about that. How did that happen, the first contact, serious contact? Well, the first serious contact was when I was in science class, and I had a friend who came from Bangladesh. He was born in London, but he's ethnically Bengali or Bangladeshi. And he would basically refrain from doing certain things and talking to certain people. He wouldn't do an unnecessary social interaction with the opposite sex. I found that quite bizarre. And he was like, you know, because we honor women in Islam. And he was linking some of his practices to his beliefs. Beautiful. For that, for me, was quite fascinating because I was very attracted to that type of difference, different attitudes yes. towards people and different behaviors that were not part of normal society. I found that quite attractive, that he was distinct and honorable in that way. So that was the first type of interaction. But the main interaction is when I, in the later years at high school, is when I had Muslim friends, I'll go to the mosque once and I prayed Juma, the Friday prayer. I asked them certain questions and I found the belief very empowering because these kids, they were very distinct but empowered with their belief to the point was as if it was a self-evident truth. And for me that was quite fascinating. So the more direct engagement came when I went to college. Now, what I mean by college is the two years before university. Yes. But in America, you say college means university, but... It means the same thing sometimes. Okay, no worries. Yes. So the few years before university, when I went to college, I basically had a very direct interaction with the Islamic tradition to the point where people would be more direct in talking to me about the core beliefs, practices. And I was really interested in different cultures. And at the same time, I was reading about Buddhism. So I was very fascinated concerning the Buddhist so tradition. So you had some interest in this kind of issues, the spirituality? All the time, because my dad brought me up like that. You know, my dad. dad would never talk about money or how to grow a business. My dad would never talk about, you know, you should wear the best clothes or have the materialistic lifestyle. His main concerns were always about... Character. Character and also about what it means to exist. The existential questions in life. Who am Typical I? Typical Greek man. I mean, well, this not question really, is not really, being raised well, in Greece. Well, ancient Greek man. Yes. Not, not a Greek man now. Greek yes. men now, mm. unfortunately, they've been... They've been drowned by the tsunami and, of materialism yes. and avid True. capitalism. So my father was basically helping us ask and answer the questions, who am I? That's wonderful. What am I? Whose am I? For whom am I? <laughs> wow. So all the big questions. So I was always interested in that. That for me was very important because that gave you meaning. True. Because, you know, you could become a doctor... You, become, you could become a politician, you could spread peace in the world and you could cure cancer. But if I didn't have these questions answered, it would be irrelevant. True. Because that would have no meaning. Because if you end in the grave, you just become one buffet. You're just a rearrangement of carbon. So what makes... I like that. What makes, of carbon. Yeah, what makes a chocolate bunny any different from me? If I crush the chocolate bunny, that's just a rearrangement of carbon. True. And if I hang myself or shoot myself or crush myself, why is that any different from a chocolate bunny? From a materialistic, physicalist, scientific perspective, is this a rearrangement of carbon? Correct. So what makes any difference? There must be some kind of meaning that has a basis for our lives. So that's why these questions for me were so important. If you can't answer them, you can't be truly happy. So you were intrigued by the practices of those guys. You were observer. Then you became curious why this guy does not engage in social activities like the other guys. Then you went to the mosque and you saw those people and the way they believe it is like they have the real things. That got, more, got you more curious. Emotionally, obviously. that got me definitely curious. So when I was in college and I used to talk to different Muslims, obviously the Muslims were not great because they would practice one thing or they should practice one thing, but they were doing other naughty things as well. But they still understood what was right, and they would articulate that. And I liked the brotherhood that they had. It was quite transcendent. It transcended cultural, ethnic, 
and social variables and barriers. So, and on the other hand, some of the values my dad brought me up in or with was quite in line with the Islamic tradition anyway. But at the same time, I was very interested in Buddhism. So I had like multiple interests. You know, I like Kung Fu. I used to train in Wing Chun Kung Fu. I like Chinese medicine, herbal medicine. I used to learn Mandarin. Interesting. Yeah. So I found that, you know, dealing with different cultures and, and beliefs was, was, was quite something that I enjoyed and fascinating. Like, you know, I used to like Bruce Lee's philosophy, you know. And, and that was it, really. So I was interested in so many different things. So in college, you came in the first serious contact now with Islam, where you started investigating the belief system, or uh, was it an incident or a relationship? No, that, I mean, well, not, so tell not me at that, that, stage, that not, stage. Not at that stage, because at that stage for me, I didn't even focus on my, on my it's called A-levels, on my exams. Mm -hmm. Although I was quite bright. I just didn't find any meaning in it. Subhanallah. Like for me, so who cares I become a doctor? Who cares I get married? Who cares I become a millionaire? So what? I'm going to die. Who cares? It's delusion. It's like you're drunk. Like people who think this is meaning in their life for me, I think this is drunk. It is they're it? drunk with the world and they think they're happy. And the only time they wake up is when the internet breaks down or that's, that's she extreme. left me or they get depressed. The thing is, people are drunk with life and they think... You know, they have this full sense of self-sufficiency that I'm going to be somebody and look at me. And I was like, I already know I could be like that. I had that capacity. I was very bright. But I didn't really focus on it because I didn't answer the big questions like, who am I? What am I? Whose am I? For whom am I? Yeah. And maybe on a Friday night, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. For a young man in college... In this age, that is very unique and unusual. Really. But I was very childish as well. Don't get me wrong. I was very, I still was very juvenile and very kind of. I used to like to joke around, and you know, I had girlfriends, and I wasn't like, you know, the serious monk thinking about man, life, and the universe. But it's as if I had a split personality in a way. Like I'll do the things I want to do: play football, do kung fu. But in the back of the mind, was, my, was always these things. What always. the meaning of the. Yeah, the meaning Being of life, this, the meaning uh, of meaning, <laughs> it was everything. So when, when the interest in Islam started, I see now your background, religious-wise, religion was not pushed in your home. No, no way. So you grew up basically on philosophical basis more than religious basis. Yeah. Now you are very religious. I, I, I can see that. Well, maybe. So <laughs> tell me where the transformation started. And how? Yeah, well, I went into university and I started to study psychology. Well, I studied something else and I changed into psychology. And I was still relatively sheltered in terms of meeting different types of people from outside of London. And the people I was with generally were like the Muslims or the Turks or the Pakistanis. And generally they had a culture of... It wasn't too selfish. It wasn't what's in it for me. There was still this kind of communitarian bond going on. But when I left that group, I went into university, I met other groups of people. It was not the same culture. And it was depressing. University was the worst time in my life. It was the worst time in my life. Hmm. Because I met all these people and I realized that they don't care about sincere human relationships. It was what's in it for me. This avid individualism. I'm all right, Jack. And for me, it didn't resonate with me because I was never brought up like that. You know, my mom would always call me a thema. A thema in Greek is someone who does everything for people and gets walked over. Because I used to help, like to help people a lot, like help them with the essays or with the school or whatever the case may be. And when I entered that environment, I was a bit depressed thinking, these people are shallow. Like I would wear the same jumper for two or three days. It's clean, I'm a clean guy, it's not a problem, it's a student. People will com comment on that. And I'll be like, there's something wrong with this person. Why do they find it so important if I wear a jumper for more than a day or not? And it was a shallow, it's a shallow culture. So you're living your life from spiritual, basically, if we want to say, 
perspective, while the materialistic people around you were making it difficult. There well, it wasn't just they were materialistic. It was like, this is the culture of some Western institutions and people work, working or studying within yeah. them. That is, yeah. It's about me, where am I going to go, who I am going to be. Me, myself, I, it's as if their self becomes their own deity. So your values basically were... Well, it was misaligned, totally yes. misaligned, totally. So, so this is why one of my best friends was a 27-year-old at that time, and I was only like 18, so he was like nearly 10 years older than me, but I would really relate with him because he was a little bit more balanced, a little bit more existential, what does it mean to exist? And, yeah, it was, it was a bit of a difficult time at university. I didn't really resonate with people too much. So now, Islam came to your life somehow. Well, it came when I left uni mm -hmm. because I basically, a big issue happened at university and I had to take a year out and redo this, redo, redo this module. And the situation wasn't my fault, but everyone got blamed and it's just a long story. But the point is, I left and I said, what am I going to do with my life now? I have to do something in this year. I can't just do one evening class. So I applied to different jobs and alhamdulillah, I was so fortunate by the will and mercy of Allah that I got offered a job as a project officer, student project officer, which was in the realm of project management. Mm -hmm. And in this job, they threw money at me, PRINCE2 training, PMI training, Mashallah. ISEB training. And as a, what I was, how old was I, 20 or something? I was getting all of this training. And it really facilitated a career for me. So in this job, I basically was um, somebody who was young, but yet very loud and expressive and wants to bring people together and was real. I didn't do office politics. I was just cut to the chase. Right. And they liked that about me. And I found that quite interesting because there were some really, really nice English guys there because the office was in England. And he always said to me, never change, be like this. So as you do in kind of this kind of working environment, there was a Christmas party. And during this Christmas party, we said we're going to go on, on the boats, Christmas party boat. Now, my office was where the police IT organization was. That was my organization. Now it's been disbanded, it doesn't exist anymore. But it was linked to the government. We're doing IT systems for nationally for the police. Mm -hmm. And my office was on the ninth floor on the River Thames facing St. Paul's Cathedral. It was a beautiful view. And one, there was one, a boat nearby and we'd walk to it. And we would basically have the Christmas party there. And I wasn't a very good dancer, to be honest. So I wouldn't dance. So I wouldn't drink hardly. I used to love milk rather than drink. As my dad always says, this is a milk family. Yeah, we don't drink. We're, we're, a, milk, good. we're a milk family. Milk family. Even my dad is 65 drink. years old and he just drinks milk all the time. Yeah. Nothing better than that. Of course. So I was trying to dance. And then this particular lady came towards me. And alhamdulillah, she was relatively attractive, right? So I never wanted to dance. I always wanted to talk to people. And that was one of my, what I call, personal diseases, that I wouldn't talk to people that I'm very close with, but I would talk to strangers. To strangers. And connect with them in a, an amazing way. But close people, I would just basically want them to not say anything, but just be next to me. It's very weird. It must have been, maybe something bad happened to me when I was younger. I don't know <laughs> what, how to explain it. So I wanted to engage with this person, and I found out she was Muslim. And I was like, hold on a second. You're not supposed to be here. I know my Muslim friends wouldn't be here. <laughs> exactly. And she thought I was like some kind of mufti or some kind of imam saying, you know, undercover imam. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like saying to her, you know, they don't respect you. Look, you're beautiful. They're going to just take advantage of you. And I took the drink out of her hand and I bought her an orange juice. Bold so, move. Bold move, but I was always like that. Yeah. So... We connected and we exchanged phone numbers and she spoke about her family, her brothers, her culture. And you could tell she was one of those sisters that really likes Islam and respects it, but there was no love at home. So every time she wanted to come towards Islam, there was a barrier because the people that were representing Islam, there was no love. 
given and the it, negative messages. Yeah, and that's one of our problems as a Muslim community. Energy. We don't revive rahmah. We don't revive mercy and compassion in our homes. Although the Prophet wasallam said, be loving. He said, if you love somebody, tell them. True. He used to carry Hassan and Hussein on his shoulders and he would say, I love so-and-so. Oh Allah, I love him, so love him. The Prophet wasallam said, you won't enter paradise until you truly believe and you won't truly believe until you love one another. Absolutely. I mean, the Prophet ﷺ told Aisha, his wife, radiallahu anha, may Allah be pleased with her, be compassionate. When you put compassion, compassion in something, it elevates it. When you remove compassion, it degrades it. I mean, this is our tradition. True. As Ibn Qayyim al jawziyyah the 14th century theologian said, where you see your rahmah, where you see mercy and compassion, you must see Islam. So True. she's a product of him. I never blamed her. But anyway, we didn't meet. I lost her number. She lost mine. And what happened was is, I think after a couple of months, I got a call in my office from the HR department, which was a few floors above me. And they said, Mr. Zodis, we have so-and-so on the line. I was like, wow, she found me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was actually quite happy because I thought she was a really nice girl. Right? And we started dating and having a conversation and being friends. But even during that period, I used to read this book by an Egyptian scholar. I forgot his name now. It's called Islam in Focus. It's a yeah. very old book. And I used to read about Buddhism too, but when I would meet her, I would always talk about Islam, but at the same time, we wouldn't be interacting the way Islam wants. But I was still trying to preach to her, even though I wasn't a Muslim. Even in that's, her... That's very interesting and unique. Of I've course never heard that Yeah, before. I know. That's... Well, you know, that's, it's crazy stuff. <laughs> and on her wall, I remember I would stick big articles on her wall about Allah and Quran. Oh, wow. I would write notes for her. Anyway, to cut a long story short, she had to move back up to her town. She was studying to be a teacher. And she had to go get married or whatever happened. And then she calls me and basically says, after a while, that I just want to let you know that I'm praying five times a day and I'm wearing hijab. Yeah. Allah. yeah. It's quite special. So, you. I'm sorry. Marvelous. Alhamdulillah. So that was really troubling for me. Because I wasn't a Muslim. And that made me realize. How you guided her. And you were not following the same guidance well, yourself. Well, I, I needed to think about my life. That was the big problem. So... I went to Greece and I remember I was reading Quran in the English language and the life of the Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace. And I learned how to pray. I learned how to pray myself. I learned how to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Ikhlas, in Arabic all myself. And I used to pray. I remember I used to go to the mosques, right, in England. And I used to be quite slim and I used to wear tight jeans and tight shirts and my skin would show. And the Imams would always tell me off. <laughs> they never knew I wasn't Muslim. It's like, you shouldn't be praying like this. So I was in Greece and then it was like, you know, I didn't want to drink much. I didn't want to party or go early to the house and just read Quran in English. And when I came back to England, and then I gave up, you know, I remember going to a mosque and I remember my friend telling me at college, when you're in prostration, you are the closest to your Lord. So scream to him. I would scream and shout. I remember I was in sajda, prostration, saying, if this is you... And if you're real, and if this is the truth, then show me. And after that point, I just gave up. So one of my friends, you know the friend in school who didn't speak to women? Mm -hmm. He came and saw in my house after all those years. Wow. And he had this amazing project. I didn't see him for years. And it's so amazing how things work out, how Allah plans. <laughs> so he had this crazy project. He wanted to take this new sport into the Olympics. He had this vision of, it's called pat ball or thumb ball. Yeah. Okay. Was, and he wants to take it to well, the Well, he wanted to speak okay. to me because I was a project manager and he wanted some kind of help. So he re-entered my life. And then he would give me some booklets on Islam and I would be reconvinced and it would be very interesting conversations. He would be giving me da'wah, calling me to the oneness of God, to the peaceful submission to the creator, not to the creation. 
And one Friday, I think it was October the 4th, 2002, he came to my house, he just sat in my car. I went to sit in his car and he just talked to me. He said, you know this is the truth. And you know, in reality, I knew I was intellectually convinced that Islam was true. I was intellectually convinced that the Quran was from Allah, that God existed. I could even prove this better than Muslims at that time. But it was abstract. I didn't internalize it in my heart. So what he did helped me. He sat me down and just talked talk to me about death. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ دَائِكَةَ الْمَوْتِ Every soul is going to taste death as the Qur'an says. But the way my friend described it was in such a way I don't remember. It's so poetic though that to try and re-express it is trying to find or chase a black cat in the dark. You just can't. The pen breaks in two when I tried to express what happened. But it was so real for me. That I went back home in the middle of the night and I just sat and just thought and I was like, this is it. I mean, I need to take this stuff that I know seriously. I need to internalize it now. I can't be a donkey carrying books. Yeah. So on October the 5th, on a Saturday, I went to the central mosque. Lots of brothers there. And I became a Muslim. That's very, very interesting and touching. Now tell me, at that moment, you are abandoned a way of life and entering another one. There will be some positive things will happen and some probably obstacles in the way. Tell me first about the positive things you saw when you decided to make this decision. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to live what I believe now. Yes. This well, is well, it was more of a transition because I was already changing some things anyway. Like I wouldn't drink and I would pray before I would pray. But I think the most amazing thing for me, something which I miss actually, when I became Muslim was the first few months when I would go to the mosque at Fajr time, in the morning time. And it was this amazing feeling. The obstacles. Obviously, you grew up in an environment that was supportive because many Muslims in the city you grew up in and you were exposed to Islam from early age, your friends and things. I'm sure you'll have, you'll have some obstacles. Did you have any issue with the family? Any issue with the previous friends, the career? The well, my previous friends mostly were Muslim. <laughs> okay. So That's, that wasn't that a huge problem. Easy. But I did have colleagues that were women that were not Muslim and they were very upset what happened. But the main problem was family. I mean, my dad is very open-minded and so is my mom, very tolerant. My mom was a refugee from the 1974 Turkish invasion. Mm -hmm. But my sister was in, like engaged to a Turk for 10 years. I mean, they're very open-minded. But my dad was mostly upset, not because of the cultural change. Yes, my mom was upset because I changed my name, which I should What year was that, by the way? I this was 2002. Oh, right after 9-11. Now where Islam is really, really yeah, yeah, a problem. I yes. mean, come on, where are you going, guy? Eh? Yes. So my dad was upset because he said, why are you going backwards for? The things I taught you was moving away from religion being progressive, liberal, humanist, spiritual. That was his issue. So he was really upset because he was like, all the experiences he had in his life that he learned from, it's as if I threw that in his face. Yeah. And obviously we would argue for the first few years, but it would be like a friendly, loving kind of argument. But it would be intense. It would be very stressful. I think the worst mistakes I did in that period was to basically make up, a, make out, as if my dad was incompetent and that he wasn't my hero anymore. Because my dad was always my hero and he still is. I mean, his values are phenomenal. He's like a walking Muslim without faith. All he needs is the faith. May Allah like, guide him. I mean, I mean, he recently said that he believes Muhammad is a prophet. Allahu Akbar. So, uh, and he believes God is one. So he's almost there. Oh, he's, he's, he's there. He's almost there, inshallah. So... Inshallah. I'm sorry. I, I, Akhi, this is beautiful. That's what we love, the passion. And, and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. I think the worst was and this advice to new Muslims that subconsciously just because you've found the truth you think everyone who loved you is, is baseless now. And you want to try and make sure that they're wrong and they're bad. And that's what I tried doing with my father. Because he was a hero to me, but he wasn't Muslim. And I became Muslim, so what do I do with this hero? 
So I was trying to hack him down, basically. And I would really make him feel really, really bad or pick the smallest mistakes he did in his life and make them huge. And I'm a father. If my children did that to me, Will it be devastating? Of course. You know what? He is a very lucky father. He really is. So I was really bad to him for many years. And I went on this kind of psychology course that makes you realize that makes you realize how bad you are, right? Like, you know, it's your fault. Take power in the relationships you have in your life. And I realized that I treated my dad so bad. So I called him up after six years or something, being a Muslim. I said, Dad, I need to speak to you. He was in Greece nursing my, 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 great, my, my grandfather. You know, my dad was a very nice guy. He was wiping his backside, changing his, changing his clothes and... He nursed That's my. A wonderful man. Of course, he, he nursed. He nursed my granddad for three years, and I never knew he could do it. I was really, 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 really impressed with my father because my dad is a very loving guy, but he hates blood and he hates mess. Anyway, so I said, to, I called my dad. I said, Dad, I want to speak to you. He's like, who, you know, I, I hardly speak to him now. Right at that time, he thought something happened to the grandchildren or what's going on. I said, Dad, I want to let you know that I know you love me. <laughs> I know you love me, and everything you've done is because you love us. Like my dad used to work for 76 hours in a row. He wouldn't eat. He would just drink coffee. He was a laborer. He was in the factories. And he wouldn't eat at all. And he'll come back tired and shattered. He had lots of varicose veins because he used to iron clothes as well. So I said, everything you did is because you love us, even the mistakes you've done. And I said to him, you're my hero. You know, he gave all of his inheritance to his brother just to keep his family together. My dad has nothing, zero. But we Muslims don't even do that. As you see, he's a Muslim. Without knowing exactly. or without adopting the, the faith or yeah. professing the faith. But of course. now you see it. Like my, dad, my dad would stay awake for other people to sleep. He would be put in poverty for other people to... F like he would, make, he would make us eat potatoes for two weeks in order for his workers to have some food. That's how it was. Oh, <laughs> May Allah bless him. I mean, so I said to him, you're just a great guy. I take my hat off. I said, you're still my hero. We do a different traditions, but you're still my hero. And I love you. And he was crying for 15 minutes. And he hardly cries. I've only seen him cry once or twice in, in my life. And then he called my mom up in the evening. And he said to my mom that he's ready to die. He felt like a complete parent. Uh -huh. So but now our relationship is great. I could talk about hadith, Islam. He loves what the Prophet had to say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tell me now, how did Islam influence you in this period? I mean, being kind to your parents is a virtue. Of it's course. It's not a virtue only. It is a mandatory commandment in Islam. No matter what their faith is, to be kind to them. Of to course. Be. I mean, so the obviously... Yeah, the Quran, when it mentions worship Allah, then he mentions them be good to your parents. Absolutely. It's so close to the oneness of Allah to the point you disobey your parents like disobeying God. And it's almost close to polytheism. That's what, you don't do things like that. But obviously that didn't affect me the first few years because I was very passionate and zealous. But now I try and do everything for my parents. I mean, I mean they did everything. How can you repay your parents? Well, let's shift gear here yeah, and sure. go to what you do now. Of course. Uh, you are traveling the world, basically, calling people to Islam. Many people were exposed to Islam. Many people entered the world of Islam through your teaching and through your Before activities. I answer, I just want to mention something about my mom as well. Please. My mom is just like my dad as well, super sacrificial. And, you know, she was a refugee and she sacrificed so much. And she gave us so much love as well. Like my mom's love is like ishq. <laughs> it's like ishq. a possessive form. Yes. Ishq is like a possessive form of love and it's very powerful and she's full of energy. And, uh, and you know, because I speak about my dad a lot 
that's because he has an influence. But my mom, you know, sometimes I think I'm like my dad, but in ways I'm so like my mom, that energy that I have. Because my dad sometimes just sits back at home and reads a lot and is quiet for a few hours. But mom's always energetic and I got that from my mom as well and very loving and I think I got that from my mom as well. So, you know, I always also want to mention like my mom is actually a gem. You know, how many women are refugees and accepts people, accepts the race that entered her homeland and, her, and took over her, home, her house. And, you know, she was running through the morgues looking if her, if her brother was dead or not because he was fighting in the front line. So the point is she, she's a gem as well from that perspective. So... I like I do. Beautiful. Now, the work you do, back to that, uh, obviously, you studied. Now you are a Muslim. And, uh, By the way, this reminds me of Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> it's like the Oprah show. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the, the, you're genuine, brother. Yeah, well, sure. You really are. Sure. And I would like to tell your dad, you should be proud of this man. You're lucky. You're blessed, actually, to have a son such as Hamza. And uh, what I want to touch on now with you is you entered Islam and from the short time I've listened to you, I interacted with you, you expressed a great amount of knowledge. So obviously now you are on a path of, I don't know, was it searching or enhancing yourself, elevating yourself? Can you ta talk about this period of time, preparing yourself as a Muslim? Now, mashallah, you're leading movements. Well, I need to need. Uh, I mean, to I, I was something. always, you know, brought up to express myself, and if I believe in something, I'm going to try and speak about it. For example, I used to love kung fu and Bruce Lee and Wing Chun and Chinese medicine. I would always speak about it. So it was natural that if I adopted Islam and I found it was the truth, I'm going to speak about it. So I was really interested in re researching concerning Usuluddin, the foundations of the religion the Qur'an, God's existence, the miracles of the Qur'an, etc. Were you doing that on your own now, or you have a mentor, a teacher? Well, now we have it. mentors, but in the beginning it was on my own. Okay. It was a very lonely place. We don't, the state of da'wah, the state of calling people to Islam in 2002, 2003, was a very lonely place, generally speaking, right? Right. But now it's different. We have ulama, mashayikh, we have scholars Activist, that help us, uh, activists. Yes. It's a great time now. We, now it's a juncture point in history. At that time, it was a little bit lonely. And so I was interested in that stuff, and I got into the lecture circuit at university to talk about the Qur'an, and talk about why I became a Muslim, to talk about the kind of intellectual foundations of the religion. Right. So since then, that's what we've been doing. We've been engaging with atheist academics, and we've been talking about Islam, and writing, and reading, and we've done lots of mistakes. But that's the of nature course. of the da'wah, is the one who has never done mistakes in the da'wah before, has never done da'wah before. True. So you learn from the mistakes. And now we're, there, now we're here to train people and to create new leaders and to create people to saturate the kind of intellectual market so we could really have a voice. And that's very important because uh, see, we need to articulate a warm, compassionate case for Islam to the wider society. See, so you grew up in an environment totally different from the environment. It is in the West, but totally different from the American environment. Yeah, sure. So we have Muslims here who are passionate, who are uh, engaging in the da'wah. However, the field is totally different. You yourself, you had the privilege of being around Muslim students. There are towns here where there is no Muslim whatso Muslims whatsoever. And contacting a Muslim is an adventure. <laughs> okay, I, I experienced that myself. So what do you have to say to the non-Muslims when they are approached by a Muslim or when they want to have a relationship, whether a business relationship or social relationship or academic relationship with Muslims? Some people have fear. Some people have hesitation, especially after 9-11. People here well, changed. You know, I was at one of the Islamic centers yesterday, today, yesterday, the day before yesterday. We had an open house. And we invited the non-Muslims, the Texans, to come and sit with us. Yeah. And there was many non-Muslims there. And I was advised by some of the Muslims, be a bit careful, don't be too preachy. And I said, forget that advice. I'm just going to be myself. Wonderful. So I was myself, and we engaged in such a way, a non-Muslim Christian man could tarry, a black man, stood up, and he was crying. 
And he was like, shocked. I don't believe Muslims are like this. They oh. believe in Jesus. They believe in the Bible. They have family. Look how multicultural they are. He said, in my church, there's black people. I can't walk into a white church sometimes. I feel a bit different. He said, these people are full of love. Because I said to people, I gave advice to one non-Muslim saying, if you want to engage with Muslims, knock on the door and say, can you feed me please? I want dinner. Every Muslim is going to say, come to my house. And he was shocked by, I got everyone to agree that if any non-Muslim says, I want to come to your house for dinner, they will facilitate that. And he was shocked that people were so proactive in facilitating that kind of communal harmony. And we sat with him after and he was crying. He was like, I'm 55 years old, man. He was like this. I'm 55 years old. I've never seen this before. He said, I've never, you changed my heart, he said. And he was crying. And I was like, this is what it's all about. So from that experience, to talk to a non-Muslim, I would basically say to them, just approach them and you're going to find someone who is so ever ready, even if he's rough around the edges, still ever ready to facilitate compassion between you two and for you to discuss your differences and your similarities. And not to fear, because sometimes our biggest danger is that we think our past experiences and our limited knowledge is infinite and it applies to all times and places. So we superimpose the past onto the present and the future. It's no wonder we're living a cycle. <laughs> Nothing changes because we always use the past to influence the present and the future. What we need to do is to divorce that and say, right, whatever I saw on Fox News, or whatever I saw on the media, or whatever I saw with another person or my interactions and experiences are just that, past experiences. If you learn to divorce them from the true reality from the present, then you always come up come towards new realities with a blank canvas. And that means you'll have a new realm of possibility to achieve what you can with others and connect with them in ways that, you, that you've never connected before. And that's what we need to do. And this is quite Quranic as an ethic because Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 30, God says He's going to send down Adam as a vicegerent to take care of the world, the earth. What do the angels say? You're going to send someone that's going to create bloodshed? And God, Allah says, I know that which you do not know. Meaning, the angels had limited knowledge and experience and they thought the new reality would be the same thing. But Allah says, you don't know what's going on. Don't use your limited experiences and reality to superimpose on new things. It's always new and fresh. It's always a new realm Beautiful. of possibility. And that's what we need to have with human beings. Beautiful. Forget the baggage Beautiful. and just... Treat them as they should be treated, inshallah. There are so many people out there, just like yourself, soul searching. They are trying to find a spiritual home, really. Yourself, you were in that mode before you became a Muslim. And the trigger was this conversation with a friend about death. How do you advise or what would you say to the Muslims who are trying with some people they know, whether a relative or a friend or a neighbor or a colleague, and this person is almost there. So what would you tell them so they can make that switch? And that night happens to them so they can go yes, and course. think. And the next morning they say, this is the path I, mean, I want the, to choose. The Quran as a percentage gives us the approach. Like 90% of the Quran is emotional, emotional spiritual. 10% is intellectual. So that's the kind of dose you should give to people. Like... God's existence and the Qur'an being a miracle is very easy. You could do that in five minutes. It's intellectual gymnastics. But the implications yeah. of that is the difficult thing, the emotional thing. So one thing to do is to remind them of God's love for you. Because the Prophet Muhammad upon whom be peace said that God loves us more than our mothers love us. True. And to understand that God is really... If you want to summarize the Qur'an, God is basically screaming at us saying, You are slaves... You didn't choose your birthday, your birth, your ethnicity, your gender, your name, your DNA, your socioeconomic status. You didn't choose any of these things. You're enslaved to context. You didn't choose the ism and the schism that you're conditioned to believe that beauty means you have to be like, I don't know, L'Oreal because I'm worth it, right? <laughs> or, you know, all that stuff. You're enslaved to social context and to your own context. You have so many slave masters 
your boss, your parents, your boss's boss, society, your politician, your senator, your governor, everybody wants something from you. And they don't really know what's truly best for you. And God says, hold on a second. I'm your Rabb. I'm your master that loves you and nurtures you. And I know what's really best for you, so connect to me. Free yourself from this slavery and liberate yourself by worshipping me. It is no wonder the word ruh, the soul in Arabic, in the Quran, shares the same root as the word raha, which means liberty and serenity. So the ruh, the soul, wants to achieve this liberty and it can only be done so by connecting with your, with your nature, which is to worship God and to love Him. Worship means to love Him, to know Him, to obey Him, to serve Him. Yeah. And if you do that, everything falls into place. But people are so busy worshipping themselves and their own ego. Allah. And that's the problem. And that's, that's Islam. That's the most simple way of putting the whole narrative. And that's why the famous poet, Iqbal, he was the poet of the East, he said an amazing poem. He said, this one prostration that you find too difficult frees you from a thousand prostrations. Allah. This is a beautiful statement and notes to end this program with.